Wednesday's deep dive on Brenda Condon, missing person. So you've already watched Monday's uh, Solved or Unsolved, and then Tuesday my key clue being the boots left in the men's restroom. So today we're going to try to tie it all together. And You know, I had a dream last night about this case, and that, that doesn't happen. It was really weird. Uh, I was meeting with the family, going over uh, the case and stuff. It was just a little tidbit I thought I'd throw in there because it usually doesn't happen, but I did. And I think it's because I've been really researching this. And man, if there was a case that I wish I had more info on, if I had the police reports, uh, there's probably not a lot more, but there's, there's going to be things in there that I would want to know who they talked to and who, you know, supposedly didn't cooperate, but... With missing persons cases, it's very hard to generate a criminal profile because you don't have a crime scene, you don't have a body dump location, you don't have anything. Um, but what we can do is start deducing some things. And that's basically what, you know, uh, criminal profiling is. So, I did up one for this case, and it's very vague, but... It is a, a lead. And as a detective, I've always said that's all you want is to have another lead. So, <clears throat> let me re... There was a couple mistakes I think I made earlier in the week. One was the, the day. She, was, she went missing February 27th. That's because it was after midnight. But the shift she worked was actually the 26th of February, which is a Tuesday which is even worse than a Wednesday. By worse, what do I mean? I mean, I was a bartender. I know lots of bartenders. Tuesday is not a drinking day, except for regulars usually that come in there. As you know, Fridays and Saturdays are the big days. Uh, this was a Tuesday in February very odd day I mean criminal homicides can happen any day of the week but the totality of it a bartender on a very mundane Tuesday night we're gonna get into that so Brenda Condon I put a couple links down in the descriptions so you could check out some uh, newspaper articles and stuff. So that way you can put a face to the name and read up about her. So again, Brenda Condon was a case near to where I grew up. Basically where I grew up. So I grew up in Penns Valley, uh, Center Hall, Pennsylvania. And Brenda went missing from Belfont, Pennsylvania. Belfont was our rival school uh, in high school. So... I mean, I'm very familiar with the area. The bar that she disappeared from was called Carlsbad Tavern at the time. It has since went through some name changes. It was Spectators, and then it was Home Delivery, Home D. And I think now it's uh, Robin Hood for Robin Hood Brewery, maybe, um, or something like that. Robin Hood Brewery. But I haven't been there since the name change on that last one. I don't think. But I've been there, you know, at least. A dozen times probably more so I know the area 
This happened uh, in 1991 when I was in 11th grade. At that time, I was still very much into cold cases, disappearance, unsolved mysteries, all that stuff. So this case obviously stuck out to me because it was pretty big news at the time. It's not national news. Nothing from our area there ever was except for Ray Grecar, the missing district attorney. Uh, but there were several missing people from that area. Doesn't mean they're all connected. I'm not saying that. But it has to be looked into, right? So Brenda Condon, she was what, 28 years old, 5'3", 110 pounds, brownish auburn hair with green eyes. She wore contacts. And she was only working at that bar, Carlsbad Tavern, for three days. She was last seen... Now, again, without the actual police report, you get varying times. What I went off from earlier was a 12.45 a.m. to 1 o'clock a.m. This morning when I was researching, I got a, a later time, all the way up to like 1.30, 1 1.45. Does that matter? In the grand scheme of things, I don't think so. Because... Regardless of the time there, she was getting ready to close the bar. I also a discrepancy about money being on the counter. I read that in one account. I haven't been able to see it in any other places. I'd want to know that. The receipts were put away. I've seen that on different accounts. Lights were off. I've seen that on all accounts. Music was on. I saw that on one account. See what I'm saying? I need to be able to tie that all together to be able to know. You got to have the facts. So, receipts were away, lights were off, door was unlocked. She was supposed to report the next day, next morning. So, I'm sure she was in a hurry to get out of there because she had to be in the next morning. Which tells me she is not going to be lollygagging around talking to people. She's trying probably to push people out, but again, it's only her third day, so I don't know if she would <clears throat> be that aggressive in trying to get people out, but she certainly wasn't wanting to stick around there because she had to turn around and come back in at six in the morning. A vending machine filler, cigarette vending machine, remember those? You'd go in there, put your quarters in and pull the thing and... Yeah, some of you guys remember, some of you don't. I never smoked, but I've been in a lot of bars. So he came in to fill that. Apparently, he didn't think anything was wrong. Um, the door was unlocked. He went in, did his job, left. It wasn't until the evening shift came back in and noticed something was wrong. Brenda's car was still in the parking lot. Doors were unlocked. You know, nobody's around. So, she got reported missing that evening, but the search didn't begin until March 2nd. And the reason for that discrepancy is on March 2nd, she was supposed to have visitation with her kids, and she didn't show. That triggered it. That's when everything started. So, <clears throat> hindsight 2020 is, yeah, they lost a, a little bit of time there uh, in searching, that's the way it is, you know. I, mistakes were made. But, regardless, this was in 1991, and she wasn't found again. So, <clears throat> in that, not that time frame, but since then, since 1991, you have Brenda Condon missing from Belfont. In 2000, you have Cindy Song, who was a Penn State student about 15, 20 minutes away <clears throat> from where Brenda went disappeared. In 2007, you have a lady named Joey Offit. Uh, around that area, I'm saying within uh, 20 minutes again, she goes missing. There's a fire at her house. She's gone. And then in 2014, Jennifer Shadle. 
she went missing from State College. All within a 20 minute radius. So you have one, two, three, four. Um, but you can't say that they're connected. You know, you have to look into that. But that's a lot of time for a serial killer. If a serial killer is operating in that area, you have 1991, 2000, 2007, 2014. That's a big gap with no other murders in between. Now, we don't know for sure, you know, but possible, yes. Probable, no, I'm not ready to go there yet. Now, we look at victimology, and again, victimology is very important in determining who the suspect is. Now, you ask yourself, how can you figure that out? How does the victim lead you to who the offender is? Well, it doesn't always, but it helps. For instance, we know Brenda wouldn't miss visitation with her kids. We know she was happy at the time. Uh, she was split up from her husband or divorced depending on what account it is, but she was living with a new boyfriend that she had been together for uh, a few months. The ex-husband and her got along, according to all accounts. He has been ruled out. Now, I'll tell you why I rule him out in a little bit. But her victimology says that she... She wouldn't miss. She was a hard worker. She wouldn't miss visitation with her kids. And that's why everything ramped up on March 2nd. Police, I think, were hesitant to say foul play was involved. I could tell you foul play was involved immediately. And the reason being is you look at her victimology. She left her car there. She's not just going to run away. Yes, her purse is missing. Her car keys are missing. But... Her car is in the parking lot. She leaves the bar unattended, unlocked. So with any case, after you look at victimology, we know that this is going to be foul play. Murder, or missing persons, I guess, but murder, for the most part, there's three reasons. And I've always said this. Sex, greed, or revenge. Now, people always want to comment, well, you got to throw money in there. Money's greed, okay? So, those are the reasons. And jealousy. Jealousy is revenge, okay? We can start deducing right away based just upon that bar and her victimology. We can base that. We can now start deducing of what this case is about, okay? It's not greed. It's not about money. It's not robbery. Nothing was taken. It's not about insurance money. There was no insurance to be had. This is not revenge. It's not jealousy. Now, why is it not those two things, most importantly? Because I feel that the body would have been right there, in the, right there at the bar. If this was about greed, if this was about anger, kill right there okay you wouldn't kill and then remove the body from the bar that makes no sense that makes zero sense and there was no indication of a struggle there doesn't mean a struggle didn't happen you could strangle somebody right out in the middle of the room and it would what sign of a struggle are you going to see? She can't kick nothing over. There's not going to be any blood. So, yes, I understand that. But then you leave the body there. Right? Especially if it was a greed or revenge killing. If somebody was committing a robbery, first of all, there would be money taken. And in this case, there wasn't. Second of all, if you... Let's say the offender is committing a robbery and she walks in on it. It's not, it's not possible because she's there. But if it was and you want to eliminate that witness because she knows you or because you're not going to take the chance of going to jail, 
you kill her and you leave her there. You don't take the extra step, the extra time to remove that body from that location when it's already closing time and nobody's in there and nobody's going to be there for another six hours. You're not going to remove the body and risk being seen transporting a dead body in a car. It makes zero sense. You understand what I'm saying? So to me, you can rank then, you can rule out greed or revenge. That leaves one motive, and that's a sexually motivated crime. That's what this was, in my opinion. And I base that on the evidence that's left there. Now, let's talk about suspectology. Okay, let's look at suspects. There have been rumors of only two individuals that I saw that were named suspects, and they weren't even named suspects by police. They were named suspects by public opinion. And that's usually the worst thing to go off of. Uh, but the boyfriend at the time, his name was Greg Palazzari. Now, Greg was known to be a drug dealer of cocaine at least a decade after this when he was arrested by the attorney general's office i believe bni bureau of narcotics investigation arrested him and charged him and he was making about fifty thousand dollars a month selling cocaine now this was in 2000s you know 10 years removed from when he was with brenda was he doing it back then i'm going to say probably but you know, I don't have anything to base that off of other than my training and experience, you know, running a drug task force and being an undercover narcotics agent, you know, with the FBI and other places. I would say that he was probably dealing drugs there. So you have to factor that into this. But remember, we've already re deduced that it wasn't a greed or a revenge killing. So you can eliminate that aspect out of this case so it wasn't about drugs now police have ruled this guy out I've read that but through alibi or through something now I've seen his girlfriend after this interview and she believed he had something to do with it although she could not base that upon anything so <clears throat> I'm saying no because number one he li she lived with him if he was involved directly, why wouldn't he wait just till she comes home and kill her there? It makes more sense. You're in the privacy of your own home. You're not worrying about somebody shining the headlights, coming in the door, all that. And all these people that think they're smarter than everybody else will say, well, because he he would definitely be a suspect if, if he did it at his house. He's having, making it look like it was something... Come on. Criminals don't think like that. All right? They're worrying about getting away with it. Okay? They don't want to be surprised by somebody coming into a bar or seeing them. So, no. I don't believe the boyfriend was involved. Again, if you want to say, well, he was involved because he was in a bad drug debt and they came, they would, they would have killed her. Left her right there as a message. No sign of that, right? There was a serial killer. Now, people want to say in the area. Dawn Burnham. I remember the name is Spring Dawn. She was a 17-year-old girl that was killed and dumped close to this bar. And... Well, I don't have the time frame of when that happened, but it was it was certainly after this, years after this. By close to this bar, I'm going to say 10, 15 miles from there. But she was dumped. She was dumped by a truck driver named James Cruz. He had run through that area, okay, on Interstate 80. <clears throat> Interstate 80... You know, people want to point to a trucker being involved in this. First of all, I've been to that bar many times, never once, never once 
did I see a big rig truck parked in that parking lot or nowhere near that. This guy, James Cruz, he operated from truck stops. That's where he picked up the prostitutes and kill them on his routes and then dump them. That MO is completely different than this. Is it possible? It's possible, I guess. Not probable at all. So I think you could eliminate James Cruz, the serial killer that some of the web community want to blame. I, now I will give them one thing. The three people that the sketch shows that have not been identified, that were seen in the bar, not persons of interest, just witnesses, the one does look like James Cruz. So what? Well, if you can see my Zodiac uh, magazine over there with the sketch, it looked like my partner, Salar Barbera, on the hunt for the Zodiac. I took pictures of him up to it. My point is, it looks like anybody. Okay? You can't go off sketches. You really can't. Uh, if that was the case, there's probably about 80,000 people that match that Zodiac sketch. And not all of them are Zodiac. So, James Cruz, I say you can rule him out. I mean, how's he going to get from a truck stop, which is nowhere n near where Brenda Condon went missing, to the bar without driving his truck there? Was he going to take a cab? And how's he going to get back with a, with a dead body or with a body, period, that he's abducted? He can't. He's not going to rent a car. So you can rule him out. I'm comfortable saying that. So what can we learn from the scene and victimology. This is what I come up with, okay? The person that did this, well, first did what, right? What, what, what occurred? I believe that she was abducted. She was not killed in that bar. I base that upon, like I said, she was killed in that bar the offender would not remove her from that bar. I don't feel. 110 pounds of dead weight. Why? It's not necessary. So I believe she was abducted from that bar, probably at gunpoint. Possibly knife point, yes, but more than likely a gun. Now, the offender... What can we determine about the offender? Well, you can't determine anything without with absolutely 100% certainty. But we can come pretty close. So the first thing that I can say about the offender is that he's single. Now, how do you, how do you say that, right? Well, it's a Tuesday night going into Wednesday morning. At, at least 1 a.m. And this guy's out at the bar. What's that tell you? He's probably single. He also lives by himself. Why do I say that? She was abducted. He has to take her somewhere. Now, he could take her somewhere in his car certainly an assault her granted but for him to be out late on a tuesday night to me is that he's single he's probably not employed if he is he definitely doesn't work the night shift he would have to work the day shift but he's probably unemployed that he's out drinking that late at night, which means he most likely isn't going to have to get up in the morning. It's a wheat day. It's an odd day for homicide to occur like this. You would expect this on a Friday or a Saturday night. 
One thing that's almost 100% certainty is the offender will have a car. Without a doubt. I mean, the body's gone. It's not in that general area, right? It was searched. So the offender drove there. Now, I like some of these quote-unquote profilers that now they'll take that a step further and say, and he was masculine, so he probably drove a truck, black in color. Come on. Stick to the facts. Stick to, you know, how you back up your assertion and your profile. I don't know whether he had a car or a truck. There's no crime scene there to tell me anything like that. So I will just say he definitely had a vehicle. I would say he lives nearby. That's a scary thought because I've been in that area and it's hard to believe that, you know, a killer could be that close. But I don't believe he would be coming from another area to drink at that bar. Now, she had been there. This is only her third day. So I think she caught the eye of somebody. And he was probably in that bar two other times when she bartended. I have here, it's not the boyfriend. We already went through that. He would have waited till she was at home to do anything. That she was kidnapped. She wasn't killed in the bar. I covered that. It's not greed. It's not revenge because the body would have been left in the bar and it was sexually motivated. Now that's all I can say. Because that's, you don't have a crime scene. You don't even have a body dump location. You just have a missing person. But that tells you a lot. Now what I haven't gotten into is the boots. Strategically placed, neatly, neatly in that bar. They weren't thrown. One over here, one over there. In the men's restroom. Again, you could surmise, well... If you see the boots, if you look at the thumbnail on my key clue, you'll see they don't look like they're comfortable to be standing in all night bartending. So maybe she took them off. But why the men's bathroom? That doesn't make sense. I talked about the murder of the Cram family and the state trooper that was charged in those murders. Come to find out, a guy had a shoe fetish named Charles Bonnet. And one of the keys at the crime scene that they couldn't understand was why the wife's shoes were removed from her feet in that vehicle and placed on top of the vehicle. This guy had a shoe fetish. Is that something that has to be looked at? Certainly it has to be looked into here. I'm not saying it was Charles Bonet, but those boots, if she had no other shoes to wear, which according to the accounts that I read, she didn't, I would like to see that in the police report and where they got that information from. So if that is true, you have to believe the offender did that and why, okay? If he did that, to me, based off of that, you would have to say he was an organized offender versus a disorganized offender. He's doing something extra that's not needed to commit the crime. The crime being murder or kidnapping takes the time to place those boots there. Why? That's the big question. I'm not 100% convinced that that was the reasoning because if it was the offender that placed them there, maybe wouldn't it be more of shock value if that's what he's going for, if this was his signature, to place them on the bar? Why behind closed doors, if the doors were closed in a men's restroom? I want to know, did she have to clean the toilets after shift? Or did they have a cleaning clue, cleaning clue 
Holy. Cleaning crew. Kenny, come in and clean up those toilets. Maybe that's the reason they were there. They weren't haphazardly removed. If somebody was being sexually assaulted, the boots are the first thing that come off the victim's body. And they're not neatly placed. They are flung. Okay? So those boots were either taken off by her own accord and placed there, or the offender did that. I don't know which one it is. Again, it is a clue if you believe the accounts that she didn't have any other footwear to change into. It's February. Could the offender have made her remove her shoes in order to control her? Again, if that's the case, you are absolutely looking at an organized offender. Somebody that knows what they're doing, that this is planned. Yeah, without a doubt. And if that's the case, and this is an organized, skilled offender, this isn't his only one. Can't be. Now, I got to be careful what I say here because, you know, the media in this area will latch a hold of that and the headlines will be, you know, famous cold case investigator says serial killer is in state college area. I don't want that. I don't, I'm not saying that. I'm saying all avenues have to be looked at, and I'm sure that the police department's done that. I kind of know Joe Sigich. I had mentioned this before. I'd worked with him on the Don Miller case, talked to him briefly. He showed me a binder of Brenda Condon, which he had on his desk, which I was impressed about, that it was on his desk and not filed away somewhere. And he seemed to be a very... Um, good investigator and his heart definitely is in the right place so I'm sure that they followed those things up I guess my job here is it certainly isn't to point fingers because hindsight's always 2020 you know you can Monday morning quarterback all you want um, but you weren't on the job then and you don't know and I don't know I don't know what they did I'm only going by newspaper accounts and the accounts that I heard growing up in that area. In this case, always, always, always sticking with me. And the fact that there were so little clues. But the biggest one being those boots. And again, I would want to know where they got the information from that she never had or did not have other footwear to wear. I'd want to know the last two times that she worked did she wear those boots? Also, I believe the offender was in there the other two nights that she worked. I believe that. So where is she? Where is her body? The organized offender is the scariest offender there is. Think of Ted Bundy. Now, certainly he's a serial killer, and everybody knows Ted Bundy, but he was the classic organized offender. Even though some of his crime scenes may have showed some disorganization to it, he was an organized offender. He planned. He had a rape kit with him. He was cunning. He used ruses. He would have his arm in a fake cast. He would drop some books ask a girl to help pick him up. When she did, he'd pull a small crowbar out of that cast, hit her over the head, throw him in, in his vehicle. That's an organized offender. 
and they're scary, okay? Because they fit in, they pass you in the grocery store and you wouldn't, you wouldn't blink an eye. And that begs the question, if this was an organized offender, and I think it was, but, but it's very hard to tell because again, there isn't really a crime scene. You kind of have something at the bar, you know, and the bar scene tells you a lot, you know, nothing being taken, the door being unlocked, and then the boots. But you don't have the victim being displayed. You don't even have a body, so it's it's hard. But I you know I did my best based off of the evidence that I see, and from what I see, it would be an organized offender. And that's scary because it's possible that there is there is somebody that got away with murder and he more than likely did it before or since. That's, that's the reality of it. Well, let's see if there's anything else I want to get into on this case. I think another trooper that helped me out a little bit on this Don Miller case, who I know fairly well, uh, Trooper Brian Wakefield, I thought I read he may have taken over this case at one point in time. I'm not sure. But me and him, maybe somebody else, we actually went, I think we took our ground penetrating radar or a cadaver dog or both to a house, a backyard, where we got a tip that Cindy Song, one of these four girls that were missing, was buried. I believe it was her. Of course, nothing was found. And then we also went to another location where a kid was supposed to have been buried by uh, Otis Toole. He was a serial killer, I believe, from the 70s. He confessed to a lot of murders that he didn't do, but he did kill before, so but we didn't find anything there either. I think the cadaver dog alerted, and but then, you know, nothing was found. So, so, so I have some connections, some degrees of separation with this Brenda Condon case. I have down here, why, why make her take off her boots? And that's assuming that the offender made her take off her boots. And I have two reasonings that I can find. Control and fetish. Now, they certainly could be taken off in the course of a sexual assault. But again, they, would be, they wouldn't be neatly placed. I have down here that I believe 100% that it was a sexually motivated crime. What else can I add to this? The, again, there's not a lot. There's not a lot to go on. But, like I said, I believe he's a single white male. Now, why do I say white male? Well, because I've been in that area. I grew up in that area. First of all, there's not a lot of population of black people. It just, there's not. That's my... That's my reasoning for saying it's a white male. Um, going into the bars, especially that time, you almost never saw a black individual in that bar. And if you did, he would stand out and police would know about it, without a doubt. That's the way it is. So I'm confident saying that this guy was a single 
white male. Now, is it possible that he had a girlfriend or was married? Yes, I guess it's possible. But the, the wife would either have to know about his nefarious activities going out late at night after he went in bed or whatnot. But he had to take her back somewhere for this sexual assault to occur. And I believe he lived close because you don't want to drive somebody that's being held hostage a great distance away. There's more of a chance for her to escape or draw you know, looks, even though I get it, it's two in the morning, you're not going to see a lot. But I still think that he, he lived close by. Again, certainly he could have not taken her to his house and sexually assaulted her. He could have taken her down many back roads that are in the area. But you would think that if that happened, he would have discarded her right there along the, the road that he was on. She would have been found. But hey, it's like a needle in a haystack in these, you know, you're talking rural Pennsylvania. There's a lot of woods. So I would think more than likely he took her back to his place if he was an organized offender and he got rid of her body very carefully and meticulously, you know, either by burying her, you know, putting her in a body of water or something to that effect. So it's my hope, I guess, that this video and this whole week of videos shines more of a light on Brenda Condon's case and again I've been in contact with Brenda's daughter and she was all about that you know that's what she wants and that's what I want for her and for her family I would also love to have access to the police reports you know I, I was so close I had the binder in front of me once and I did briefly look at it but I didn't go in depth. I had my own case that I was focused on at the time. And I, I wish I would have spent more time on it. But uh, I just didn't have that opportunity. But I would love it now. Center County, Pennsylvania, which is where I grew up, has five, six seven unsolved homicides in missing persons. I don't consider that a lot based on the population and we're talking going back you know to 1960. That's a lot of decades. But to me one of them is too many. But I know that the new Center County District Attorney Bernie Cantora, who I don't know personally, but uh, we sent some emails and some regular snail mail back and forth about uh, job opportunities and stuff like that. He does seem like he cares. And they recently solved a cold case. I think her name was Tuggle or something, you know, of that effect. But uh, they had solved that. So whoever they have working these cases is doing a good job at least from outward appearances. And I would hope that maybe this would shine more light on Brenda and to get that case going again, not just on the anniversaries, you know, of her disappearance. How about all the time? You know, how about we go and talk to some more people? Start looking at the possibility that this is an organized offender and he lived nearby. So let's start looking at people within a 10, 15 mile radius that are not sexual predators, you know, you don't have to look at Megan's Law. People that maybe have been arrested for certainly a sexual assault, but maybe a peep and tom, maybe a breaking and entering, you know, something to that effect. He more than likely would have had that. And if he didn't have that then, he would have it now because it's been 20 years removed, 30 years removed. You know, he certainly didn't stop. He may have stopped killing. Sure, an organized offender will stop killing. The BTK killer did. He stopped. But he has to relive those fantasies. And usually they do that by going back to the crime scene, going back to the body dump location, just like Ted Bundy did, just like author Shawcross did, uh, or like John Wayne Gacy did. You know, you have, of course, 
all of his victims, 30-something, were under his crawl space. He didn't have far to go, but he kept the jewelry and stuff like that. I wish there was more to go on. I wish I could help more in this case. And the way I can help is by doing exactly what I did. A bit of a criminal profile, crime scene assessment, what I would look for. You know, hopefully law enforcement will see this and take it and do something. That's all I can do is put it out there. And again, I do this for the victim and the victim's family. You know, Brenda's daughter it was all about getting this done and I'm 100% behind her. And this is the only way that I know how to do it. But my experience is, you know, 18 years as a police officer and a detective, working with the FBI, you know, having a, my master's degree course studying criminal profiling and learning with some of the best in the business that I worked with in doing this. You know, Jim Clemente and Mark Safarik, Mary Ellen O'Toole, you know, the great profilers. You know, and if I could took just a little bit from them over the years that I've worked with them, which I have, and develop that into my own thought process, and in what I do, I create this, and hopefully it helps. So enough rambling on. It was today's deep dive. Thursdays is always the live session where we're going to talk about Brenda's case. Then Friday, I do a video where I answer your questions and comments. And we do that every week. So this week is dedicated to Brenda. And we just don't forget her. And much thoughts and prayers as always. As always. The most important to the victim and the victim's family. So with that, Maine's out.